Christians, personal freedoms are inhibited and restrained. Rather than advocating a revolution, they want to build a second realm, one that is free from the rulers of the first realm. More and more parts of our lives can be transferred to the second realm until an individual lives mostly free and the second realm will being technically ruled over in the first realm. One day the first realm rulers may lose their power due to everyone joining the second realm. Technically, the second realm is described as encrypted communication, encrypted currencies, anonymous and pseudonymous identities, and untraceable action. Like Neo in the Matrix, by day he's just a computer programmer, by night he's an expert hacker. Only in the second realm, nobody will be able to find the connection between the two, or so they say. I could be my usual self in the first realm, pay some taxes, pretend to have a normal, li uh, normal job, and be an ordinary citizen. In the second realm, I could be free, do whatever I want. So the agenda for today, uh, if we're going to talk about the second realm, we've got to talk a little bit about the first realm. But as anarchists, I know we're all pretty familiar with what the first realm is. You know what it is, even if you aren't familiar with the terminology. So uh, I'll talk about the second realm. We'll talk about temporary autonomous zones, which are crucial to uh, the developing of these free autonomous zones. Uh, we'll talk about various elements of the second realm. There's a lot of stuff that uh, goes into it, and I'll kind of provide a brief overview today for you. And hopefully, obviously, the goal by the end of this presentation is to show you the efficacy of this strategy and to get you motivated to start building second realms yourself. So I'll give you some action steps and things that you can do today um, to help bring these, uh, bring these uh, into fruition. And uh, then the last one, questions. At any time, if you have any questions, feel free to you know, holler them out. Um, that's uh, perfectly fine. And we'll go ahead and get started here. So. Over the past 50 years or so, uh, many strategies have been proposed as routes for, pers uh, for increasing one's personal freedom, uh, some completely worthless and even counterintuitive, uh, others all right, and uh, there are even a few terrific ones. So I'm just going to real briefly go over this to kind of set the stage for uh, solutions. So first off, in this picture, we have a, uh, looks like a, you know, some sort of a crusader, maybe a nice Templar or something like that. But there's one major difference between this guy and your normal, you know, nice Templar crusader. This guy has an I Voted sticker on, so he's a political crusader. And uh, this strategy is, <laughs> historically, uh, historically, it's, uh, it's never brought about personal freedom. Um, you may, uh, instead of, uh, you know, having 175 pounds of pressure on your neck by the, uh, having a 175 pounds of pressure on your neck by some jackbooted thug, you have 150. So I don't really necessarily consider that a win, in my opinion. So political crusading is uh, probably the worst strategy that's uh, proposed. This next one. Uh, <laughs> so... In the background, for those who may not be able to see, we've got some sort of protest or some sort of social gathering, and uh, overlaid is a toilet. So this is cultural bowel movements or collective movementism. This is the naive idea that you can get large groups of people together to you know, reach typically some unachievable goal. And there are two problems with this strategy. First off, <clears throat> Oftentimes, the individual gets lost in the collective. It becomes, uh, you know, not about, uh, you know, individual, you know, individuals. It becomes, it becomes about the collective goals of the group. So that's uh, one major problem for individualist anarchists is that, uh, you know, with uh, these collective movements, um, you know, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of anti-individual, at least in, the, in a certain sense. And the second problem is, I mean, there are organizations that start out and, you know, I might say, those, that's a really, you know, I, I, I agree with the cause, you know, best of luck to you. But unfortunately, what's, What's the goal of these collective movements, movement uh, organizations is to attract more people. And what do you have to do to attract more people? Well, you have to dilute the message and make it more palatable for, you know, more people. And therefore, uh, you know, down the road, unfortunately, the organization becomes completely unrecognizable from where it actually started. So I guess those are a couple of problems with uh, collective movementism. And now we're going to get into some positive ones. Uh, so this is uh, just, an, just an example like intentional communities. Um, that is a strategy that's been uh, proposed and tested out uh, you know, throughout, the, I guess, the mid-20th century. And uh, it's a decent strategy. I guess the only problem is that it's uh, in a permanently fixed location, which I'll talk about uh, later on in this presentation. And how many of you guys have heard of agorism? Yeah, very good, very good. So agorism is a great strategy. I don't think uh, we're nece necessarily going to see agorism, uh, you know, as Konkin laid out. Uh, I don't think we're going to see it starve the state. But um, as a route for, you know, increased personal freedom, um, I think agorism is a really terrific route to go, a great strategy. And then uh, obviously the stuff I have special vested interest in, uh, the, direct, the direct action series, which we did on uh, Liberty and Attack Radio. Um, definitely a, a cert definitely eff efficacious freedom strategies. And then uh, VANU, uh, which I talked about uh, last year. All right, so let's uh, begin by defining our terms. 
So what is the first realm? Uh, the first realm is a society that does not respect self-ownership or individual liberty, but rather heralds the supremacy of government and authority. I lost my place. Uh, in other words, it upholds a collective as superior to the individual. Uh, a one-directional isolation of import-export is used to maintain access to these servile societies open, but not free trading centers, yet denying them access to a Venuans uh, or Second Realmers home through importing goods and knowledge while exporting labor or products back out to the servile society. So that's a mouthful. So the first part of that is just what we recognize as the state, uh, anti-individualist, -indiv anti uh, anti-freedom, um, all those sorts of things. And then the second part of that isn't as important right now, but uh, it's basically describing the fact that um, these realms are uh, these realms are you know separate and distinct. So there's a first realm and the second realm, and there is interaction between the two. But we'll get more into that as uh, as we move forward. So that should just give you an idea of what uh, I'm talking about when I refer to the first realm. Okay, so for the second realm. Um, as with that first quote, uh, as with the uh, hashtag Agora, um, that one quote about technically the second realm is described as encrypted communication, encrypted currencies, anonymous and pseudonymous identities, and untraceable action. That's one, one way to describe the second realm. Another is an updated version of temporary autonomous zones, TASAs, uh, essentially the ability to conduct trade and other activities, including vices, in certain areas at particular times without reprisal from the state. Uh, so in other words, being able to partake in vices, things that they disapprove of, in a safe and free manner. Let's see if there's anything else. So I guess one other one other important one, one other important note is that second realms can be physical or digital. So you can have digital second realms like maybe the Silk Road, and you can also have physical second realms um, like um, Aurora from Alongside Night. For those of you who are familiar with that uh, with that book and film. Okay. Now the most depressing part of this presentation. Then I'll get to. Uh, <laughs> you know the the benefits of the second realm and you know well, I guess the good aspects of it but we got to start by talking about the first realm and the first realm at its core is anti-propertarian um, now there's no better there's no better example of this than um, an episode that Kyle Reardon and I did on LUA called Fee Simple versus Lodial Title the state is your landlord so how many of you think that there is such thing as private property and land ownership here in America okay all right well Unfortunately, there really has never been private property and land ownership here in America, and that's because of the fee simple system. So with Lodial Title, you are the exclusive decision maker to the property, to the land. <clears throat> you are the, the sovereign. So the King of England would be the sovereign over, you would have a Lodial Title to, you know, England. Well, if you examine the system of land ownership, land ownership here in America, it's fee simple, which means that it's at the behest of the state. If you don't pay your property taxes, if you don't, uh, you know, keep up with your local ordinances, if you don't, um, if the state wants to steal your house to put up a shopping mall through eminent domain, they can do that. Um, so that's the fee simple system. And that's, and I guess one of the note on that, that's been here since, you know, the founding of this country. So this is, that's been a staple, unfortunately. Now the bludgies or uh, as some other people might uh, you know, call them, uh, blue coats or police extortionists or whatever, um, certainly anti-propertarian because what's their main, uh, their main task? The main task is to extort people. Uh, so certainly they don't respect your property if, uh, <laughs> if they uh, just steal from you all the time. All right, and uh, I was trying to come up with a funny joke for this one uh, when I was at home preparing for this presentation, but you know, if there's really one thing you don't have to tell, tell, uh, tell libertarians about, uh, it's the Federal Reserve. So how many of you guys know what the Federal Reserve system is? Yeah, everybody, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this is, this is the monetary system of the first realm. Um, all of the, uh, you know, kind of the, uh, the, the fraudulent, inflationary, um, all of the evil things about the Federal Reserve, that is an institution of the first realm. Um, and it's there. Unfortunately, I think it's going away uh, anytime soon, except, uh, you know, unless there's mass adoption of cryptocurrencies, which would be fantastic. <clears throat> and now, um, another element of the first realm is war. And uh, war is the, obviously the most evil and despicable um, aspect of the state. More innocent people are, you know, their lives are affected by this sort of thing in uh, different countries, and also here at home, too. So that is certainly an institution of the first realm that would not exist in the second realm. And then lastly, 
talk a little bit about uh, about the culture. So, if the culture of, um, of, a, of the culture of if the culture of America was anti-statist, a state could not flourish in such an environment. But unfortunately, it's very, very, um, <laughs> very pro-government. So, you have uh, this this dynamic of entertainment and uh, media actually being used to bolster the state and to uh, you know further. I guess, um, solidify um, the state's existence. And I guess there are really no better examples of this than uh, the thing that's been going on for a couple of years in the NFL, where uh, you know, the players are kneeling for the national anthem. All the outrage that caused, um, yeah, the uh, entertainment has a major impact on uh, you know, keeping the state in the position that it's in. Okay, so some good stuff here. <laughs> All right, so the philosophy and culture of the second realm. So the philosophical foundations for the second realm are autonomy and private property necessarily. So for this, uh, for this first picture, it's just a, a farmer's market. Um, the authors of second realm book on strategy, they're very influenced by Konkin uh, and agorism, so trade would certainly be a, a major crucial aspect of the second realm. Just a little picture I found online. Uh, independence, autonomy, freedom, and self-reliance. Those would all be aspects of the second realm. Unfortunately, with the, with the, with the first realm, uh, a lot of people are dependent upon the welfare state or um, you know, whatever, whatever institution it may be, they're reliant upon uh, you know, some aspect of it. So um, in the second realm, the idea is you know, freedom come, you know, responsibility comes with freedom. So um, those are certainly crucial aspects to it. I mentioned private property, certainly a necessity. And in the last slide, it talks about how the Federal Reserve was the first realm, uh, you know, the f was, was first realm money. Well, we have our own money now. It's called cryptocurrencies. And uh, you know, 10 years ago, they really didn't exist. So um, that's a major, major development for the second realm. And I'll talk about this more, but cryptocurrencies enable di the formation of digital second realms pretty easily, along with some other uh, technical details. More generally speaking, blockchain technology, this is technology of the second realm. I've said it many times on podcasts and, and all, all sorts of other content that I do believe the blockchain or whatever iteration of it comes next will be the infrastructure for the second realm. Whether when it, uh, if it's mesh networking, you know, um, decentralized peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, encrypted communication, you know, conducted on the blockchain, whatever it turns out to be, um, I do think that decentralized peer-to-peer -peer, peer, peer -peer technology will be, the, will be the foundation for the second realm. And then I guess one other thing I'll talk about here, privacy is extremely, extremely crucial when we're talking about the second realm. So I want to read a quote from Second Realm Book on Strategy, which you can get uh, for free at anerplex.net. I was hoping to have that book published and, you know, ready, you know in print by the uh, time of this fest, but it didn't happen. Uh, but I actually reached out to Smuggler, the author, in, deep, in the Deep Web IRC chat, a Deep Web se Second Realm, I guess you could say. And uh, yeah, he was... Uh, happy, happy to have me print it. So, um, at some point, I will have that available uh, under Libertarian Attack Publications too. But uh, to this quote, respect for property not only extends to the physical territories we occupy; it is integral to the less visible parts of our world, much of which remain unseen from unseen to observers, hidden behind encrypted anonymous digital communication. This connects us and creates another realm where property is privacy. We protect our secrets; we value them. Protecting our privacy becomes second nature to us, liberating us from the prying eyes of our enemies. But our privacy is also a key symbol for the autonomy we live. We are taking back what a totalitarian outer world wants to steal from us. What fences are to atoms, data privacy technology is to bits and bytes. We claim that both are owned by us alone. This is our place, end quote. So privacy is absolutely crucial, um, without a doubt. And that's one reason why I guess technology is a tool that's going to be used for good and for bad. That's just how it is. Uh, technology is neutral. Our tools are neutral. <clears throat> and unfortunately, we are seeing this merging of blockchain technology with the first realm through, uh, you know, know your customer laws and uh, anti-money money laundering laws and such. Um, but thankfully, there are tools being developed for second realmers, for anarchists, where we don't have to give up our privacy to use these things. Just make sure it's everything here. Okay, so yeah, before I move forward, let me talk, let me give you some some examples of second realms, both fictional and uh, non-fiction. So, um, how many of you have seen Jane Daniel Schumann's Alongside Night, uh, the movie or the book? Okay, very good. I guess Derek is the only one over there. Um, but yeah, so so Aurora and Alongside Nights. I guess the way to explain this is this underground marketplace and you know home, like people live there and they trade there and all of that, and. 
it would certainly be a uh, fictional example of a second realm. Unrestricted trade, drugs, nuclear weapons, guns, etc. Individuals retaining 100% of their autonomy. Uh, it's concealed and it's secret and completely separate from the first realm. So um, next one, how many of you have read a book called A Lodging of Wayfaring Men by a crypto anarchist named Paul Rosenberg? Derek again? Okay, okay, very good. Yes, if you haven't read that book, that's a must read for every freedom-minded free, free person. Uh, absolutely terrific. But uh, there's something in there called a free, the free digital economy. And um, they initially, I guess, hid it in a video game to remain unseen to the authorities. And eventually it grew and it grew and it grew. And this turned into a pretty massive flourishing second realm. So some nonfiction examples. I mentioned a couple of these already, but deep web marketplaces uh, like... Um, Trying to like yeah, like the Silk Road for example, um, deep web uh, or just open bazaar in general. Uh, deep web chats and communities like the one where I reached out to Smuggler uh, in that deep web IRC chat that would be a second realm. Uh, Van Nomadism meetups like uh, Rubber Tramp Rendezvous, which I'll talk about in the next slide, and um, and also uh, Vanu or, or Rayo, the main proponent of Vanu. Uh, him and Roberta, his freemates, had a polyethylene A10 in the Siskiyou National Forest. That's where they lived all the time, and uh, or most of the time. And that would be an example of a nonfiction second realm too. Okay, so temporary autonomous zones. So just to explain what's going on here, um, this is just a cover of a book by uh, Hakeem Bey, uh, Taz, A Temporary Autonomous Zone, Ontological Anarchy, Poetic Terrorism. And that's just, um, I guess, kind of the, the idea of, of, of Taz has existed, but he pretty much solidified it and put it into, uh, I guess, his, his own words. So, um, and the picture on the right, that's actually the Rubber Tramp Rendezvous, RTR 2017. There's, that's the biggest Van Nomad, uh, Van Nomad meetup out in Quartzsite, Arizona. Last year, there were about 4,000 people there, and it's growing every year pretty substantially. So um, those would be examples of temporary, or that would be an example of a temporary autonomous zone. So some uh, definition real quick. Uh, a liberated area of land, time, or imagination where one can be for something, not just against, and where new ways of being human together can be uh, explored and experimented with. Locating itself in the cracks and fault lines in the global grid of control and alienation, a TAS is an eruption of free culture where life is experienced at maximum intensity. I'll read that last part again. A TAS is an eruption of free culture where life is experienced at maximum intensity. So um, <clears throat> can you guys think of any, uh, exa any examples of uh, second realms or temporary autonomous zones? Uh, you all should be familiar with uh, at least one example. Yep, this, yeah, you guys are all at a second realm, a temporary autonomous zone right now. So, yeah, exactly. So just real briefly, since I mentioned Taz's, um, there's, uh, I guess, a similar concept called permanent autonomous zones, and these could be second realms too. Uh, but a PAS is a community, in, uh, community that is autonomous from the generally recognized government or authority structure in which, is, which it is embedded. So um, this would be things like, um, you know, uh, intentional communities. Uh, Derek's actually planning on doing this down in, uh, in uh, Texas uh, in 2020. Uh, his permanent, or his uh, intentional community would actually be a PAS. So that's just uh, an example there. But I guess, so why are, why are TAS is such a crucial aspect to the second realm? And I keep slipping, skipping around. Um, well, TAS has provided the highest possible invulnerability to coercion and give us the opportunity for our uh, culture to exist in physical space. Um, so I'll stop there for a moment. <clears throat> Obviously, you know, the anarchist community on, on fascist book is great. You know, there's a lot of great people on there. But, you know, humans are social, social creatures, right? We like to be in physical space and time. And TASAs, like these festivals, give us a chance to actually, you know, live the way that, you know, we want to live. And that's, I think, pretty incredible. I think that's why they're so popular. Um, but continuing on, um, it, uh, give, it allows us to conduct our business, organize our social relationships, and to handle conflicts in the way we think to be right. Um, so basically, it just gives us, a, gives us the opportunity for you know, our ideology to exist in physical space and time, um, rather than just being a digital sort of thing. So any questions so far? No? Okay. All right, so we're going to go into some elements of the second realm. Uh, 
Uh, and the first thing being tradecraft. And as you'll see when I, when I kind of go through these, we're talking about security culture here. Um, we're, we're here at the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest and things are great. We've got, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've got freedom. We've got this, this really awesome culture. But the first realm is still out there. The state still exists. And there are a lot of folks that would like to see us toss in cages just for holding ideas that we do. Uh, so security culture is absolutely important. And that'll, um, that's what I'm going to cover here. So tradecraft, uh, just briefly defined as the art of implementing the objectives of need to know. So the first one is pseudonymity, uh, which is obviously just uh, like Kyle Reardon, my co-host on the Vani podcast. That's a pseudonym. Um, that's not actually his, uh, his you know, given name. Uh, anonymity, most people are probably familiar with what that is. It's just, you know, being unknown. Um, opaqueness is uh, information is held between the two parties involved in a trade, in other words, keeping secrets. So if I'm trading with Derek, if I'm making a trade with Derek, how many of you have, you know, need to know anything about that transaction? Basically nobody. It's between me and Derek, it's between us. So uh, need to know. Next is untraceability, the function or movement of an object from one owner or possessor to another, from one location to another that remains hidden from any party, not just required to have this information. So kind of the same concept we're just talking about, um, you know, maybe transporting rather than trading. Uh, compartmentalization, uh, which is basically keeping information segregated between individuals. Um, I think this is what they used for the Manhattan Project, where they had you know different scientists working on different things. And they didn't have any idea what the end goal was. Um, they all had their individual tasks, and they knew exactly what they needed to, needed to know, and that was it. Deniability, uh, if all previous efforts to keep our opponents from getting a clear picture of what we do fail, it is necessary to at least keep them from using this information against us as individuals. Being able to plausibly deny our involvement in specific, ac specific action hinders a third party from confidently pointing the finger. So <clears throat> the idea is that if uh, second realmers follow these steps, and they only have the information they need to know. Unfortunately, if uh, you know the, blood, the bludgies come through and you know take you know snatch up a few of them, um, you know lying to federal agents is not typically a wise thing to do. Pretty sure it's a felony. So the way to avoid that is to not have the information at all, uh, not have the information that they're looking for. So being able you know use, utilizing tradecraft uh, gives second realmers the opportunity to you know hopefully be able to survive those interrogations and such. So very much uh, a part of the second realm is obviously the, the notion of private justice. Um, unfortunately, there will always be violators of person and property. Um, there, there just will be. And, uh, all, as, and if, when you get human beings together, there's going to be conflicts. So second realms have to have some way to dispute, uh, resolve disputes and to uh, you know, provide, provide arbitration. Because do you really think second realmers are going to go into a, a monopolistic court with their pseudonyms? Um, and, you know, have some, you know, monopolistic judge, you know, adjudicate on, you know, some matter between them. Probably not. Uh, they'd be very anti-second realm um, and uh, <laughs> reliant upon the, uh, upon the first realm. Okay, so this next one, uh, proxy merchants or import-export. So I'll kind of stick to proxy merchants here. Um, now, they talk about this in uh, one section of a uh, second realm book on strategy. Uh, so they say, quote, another area unique to our situation is the integration into the larger economy. Since a sufficient market size and diversity can only be hoped for in the long run, we are required to interact and integrate with other markets unless we want to find ourselves in a subsistence economy. How however, this integration comes with great risk. These facts call for a special career that is especially interesting uh, to people that have not yet found their vocation or who have left their previous vocation and are looking for low capital opportunities, the proxy merchants. A proxy merchant is a bridge connecting the second realm to the first realm while keeping risks at bay. Many ways of bridge building are conceivable from people who handle exchanges between second realm money and official currencies to shopping and trading agents, end quote. So this is closely related to back in the 60s, Rayo, the main proponent of Vanu, um, came up with this idea of import-exports. Um, being 100% self-sufficient wasn't, you know, desirable considering, you know, cost of things are coming down and it's not, it's not worth it to learn how to do everything. So Rayo actually realized the importance of trading with First Realm. Um, I mean, you trade, you know, trade, and they're open but not free trading centers. So this is similar to that, only, you know, Ray and Roberta is very much an individualistic thing. And uh, there are a lot, lot, lot more market interactions in second realms. So why not have an entrepreneurial role, uh, you know, available for that? So 
I guess I can provide a couple examples here of, uh, of proxy merchants. Um, the Circle Pine Center would be a proxy, our proxy merchant for this weekend. They're handling, you know, with this with this uh, private property, they handle the interactions with the state with property taxes and, um, and you know, keeping with ordinances and, and stuff like that, and we just pay them to use this for the weekend. So they'd be, a, they'd be an example of our proxy merchant for the weekend. Now, how many of you are like me and refuse to use um, centralized, you know, privacy-destroying exchanges like Coinbase and have to go through somebody to buy your cryptocurrency? Anyone out there done that before? So whenever, when it, so if the person who has a Coinbase account that you're buying from at a premium, probably they um, are your proxy merchants, getting you from first realm money to second realm money. So that's an example of that. Okay, move forward. Okay, now this section is on the blessings of technology, and this is actually another section in their book. And I, I think it's, I just think it's really important to demonstrate how all these tools come together to create digital second realms. So, uh, first off, digital encryption. Uh, thankfully, this is a lot easier to obtain now. If you were uh, around in the 1990s, um, and I guess maybe you weren't an anarchist or a gorish, you might not have downloaded it because you know the state might have deemed it illegal. But um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, nowadays you know encryption is just a commonplace thing. Like a PGP, pretty good privacy for email, uh, Signal and Telegram, both smartphone apps. Those are uh, those are terrific. So this allows us to communicate without the state knowing what we're saying, and that's uh, pretty important. For, for both ideological, you know, just privacy reasons, uh, and also, I mean, uh, can help to keep us out of trouble. <clears throat> so next is cryptocurrencies. This allows us to transact value around the world without relying upon a centralized, uh, you know, a, cent a central uh, point of failure, a central point of control. So things like Monero, Bitcoin, um, you know, we have those now. We we have we have ways to communicate encrypt, you know, communicate uh, via via encryption, and we have a way to transact value uh, in an encrypted and private manner. And next is just blockchain technology more generally. I said, I said it once, and I'll say it again. I do think blockchain technology will serve as the infrastructure for the second realm. And um, that's certainly a, a pretty crucial aspect there. It's the underlying technology for, um, for a lot of cryptocurrencies. Uh, so darknet systems like the Internet Invisibility Project, how many, how many of you guys have uh, heard of that or used it? Okay, yep, so this would be a I2P. It's just a, a darknet system uh, anonymously over the internet is how I, how I understand it. And then just two more real quick. Uh, digital signatures enable us to digitally sign contracts in unforgeable ways so that remote and pseudonymous trading can be implemented. Uh, and then mobility and remoteness, remoteness empowers us to act without uh, being physically present, removing individuals from high-risk situations. So whenever I say digital signatures here, I'm not talking about uh, like uh, if you ever sign a credit card contract online or something where they tell you to consent to electronically signing something. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking like a, a digital signature verifying that I am the person sending this PGP email. You know, it's an unforgeable way for me to confirm that, uh, for you to confirm that you're speaking with me through some sort of digital means. <clears throat> so the importance of all this is so as I said, digital encryption, we've got ways to communicate with each other. Cryptocurrencies, we can transact value. Uh, darknet systems offer us even more privacy and anonymity. And then digital signatures and mobility and remoteness allow us to not, we don't have to be in the same physical space to trade. Uh, and this is one of the great benefits of the Silk Road when it was, uh, when it was around and all the other, I guess, uh, similar, similar markets that are available now is uh, it makes, me, makes people a lot more invulnerable to coercion. If they can just order stuff online and get shipped to their house, that's pretty huge. And um, all of these digital technologies enable us to have these really incredible digital second realms that do exist today. So now we'll get to some, uh, some action steps. I'm not going to read all these word for word. Um, but just one note before, uh, Smuggler and XYZ, the authors of Second Round Book on Strategy, uh, they did lay out a list of 15 uh, you know, action steps in their book. But Kyle and I uh, had some issues with it, as we tend to do. Uh, and therefore, what you're about to see is a, is a Redux version uh, that we put out. So um, the only couple I'll read off this one is uh, number two, give up collectivist thought, especially asking for permission and requiring, uh, requiring others to support you before you do anything. Also give up the quest for philosophical homogeneity. We will always differ in the details. What's important is the end goal and respect for autonomy. So obviously, a lot of second-round lifestyles look a little different, uh, you know, a little different than you know your normal servile society uh, lifestyles. So they might come with, with some ridicule, they might come with some, uh, you know, doubt or uh, or things along those lines. But it's uh, really important to you know, realize the end goal: what do you want out of your life, and you know, go after it and not need permission from anybody. <clears throat> Secondly, uh, for the for, for that one, uh, give up the quest for philosophical homogeneity. Back when I was. Uh, 
is just coming to anarchism. I was very much, you know, into the rationality and logic. Still am, but um, if someone is a leftist, I, you know, probably I typically have, you know, this reaction of uh, okay, commie, and I block him on fascist book. Um, it's not the best thing to do, and. Now I've gotten to the point where I've interviewed uh, van nomads who have chosen that lifestyle because they think that rent is theft. I may disagree economically, but it, it doesn't really matter because they didn't go and beg the government to change laws or to you know put uh, you know price ceilings on the on the price of apartments. They said, well, what's what can I do right now to to fix this? I can go live in a van, and great, great. As long as they're using the state to, to push their economic posi uh, economic positions, I don't care. And uh, that fan I met from Australia, Carl, he's a great guy. He's a really awesome guy. And I'm glad we've, we, I've had him on twice on the Bonnie podcast. And I wouldn't have, I probably wouldn't have, uh, you know, got in contact with him before. So um, it's really important to not let those little things get in the way of, you know, uh, not let the perfect be the enemy of the good, uh, to put it another way. Uh, next one, practice good security culture in both the digital and physical realm. Uh, in the former, start using PGP, pretty good privacy, I2P, uh, the Internet Invisibility Project, uh, ZRTP, which is Zimmerman Real-Time Protocol for uh, VoIP calls like Skype. Uh, OTR is off the record for instant messaging and uh, cryptocurrencies, etc. Uh, for the latter, practice being the gray man, drive an inconspicuous vehicle, and uh, harden your Vanu home or your second realm home or whatever. Uh, number four, and this is probably the most important one, there are some physical and digital autonomous zones out there right now. Join them and help to develop their capabilities. If you don't know of any way to join, network with others and form your own. Keep in mind, however, whatever rep reputation you create for yourself is what you'll be judged by. <clears throat> So yeah, there are digital second realms out there right now. And um, I've been lucky enough to get into the Deep Web IRC chat to talk to Smuggler, the author of this book, and um, you know just other, other things as well. So um, they are out there. And um, I mean, it's great to get into these places. It's, it's a lot of fun. I'll mention culture again here to, to kind of close out. Uh, if you're an artist, writer, musician, fashion designer, or whatever, run wild in creating our new culture. So, and this is something that happens, happens spontaneously, and this was I kind of the, the really awesome culture shock I had when I first came to this festival was, uh, you know, typically I see, I see a lot of, uh, you know, in the Servile Society, a lot of American flag shirts and U.S. Army and just uh, all the things that prop up the Servile Society. But here, it was just, you know, all anarchist merch. Like, everyone was just wearing anarchist shirts, and it was about freedom. And, um, you know, that happens naturally. There was no central planner that had to say we're going to, you know, have the culture be this way. It just spontaneously happened. And uh, culture is, uh, is absolutely crucial to, um, you know, I guess any interaction between uh, any interaction between human beings but uh, the the second realm culture is, is really really awesome so <clears throat> all right so to the conclusion with the second realm we aren't building the new society within the shell of the old as per the typical quote rather we are creating a new society outside of and despite it regardless of its existence so what if this, if this uh, you know, feeling you have at, uh, at this Freedom Festival, what if this could be a more normal thing, you know, maybe 25% of the time, maybe 50% of the time, 75% uh, of the time, et cetera? You know, what if you know, this, uh, this incredible weekend could be, you know, could be uh, lived more often uh, in your life, uh, being in these free autonomous zones? So the idea is to create pockets of freedom, TASs, uh, in both cyberspace and in physical, uh, in physical space and time. So... I guess just two, two, two recommendations I'd make right now that um, would be applicable for whether you're interested in the second realm or um, other forms of direct action or other lifestyle changes. But um, two things that anyone can do right now is uh, first off, uh, work towards location independent jobs or location independent employment, um, you know, mobile occupations and or financial independence. So, um, you know, that's basically just, you know, saving up to, you know, changing your lifestyle in such a way as to, you know, save enough money to make uh, having a job uh, be optional, become optional. So those are a couple of things I'd recommend. Uh, and, you know, whether you're just in second realms or not, I mean, the idea is that we find personal freedom now. The state's going to exist, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, no matter how hard the political crusaders try, um, I don't think they're going to affect that much. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, we've got to find freedom here in the here and now. And uh, the second realm is, in my opinion, a really, really great strategy to do so, um, in addition to just direct action more generally. So... It's a couple pieces of suggested reading. Uh, hashtag Agora and A Lodging of Wayfaring Men. Both of these have second realms in there throughout. And uh, I do have Hashtag Agora for sale on the back along with the Hashtag Agora shirt. And let me see. 
I guess that's basically it. I've got stuff for sale back there. But uh, if you want to connect with me, libertyunderattack.com at LUA Radio is uh, where you can find me on Twitter. And uh, vonupodcast.com at vonupodcast. So real quick, the last quote I have for you is, Our strategy for liberty is the creation of a culture of liberty, a society that occupies its own protected space and implements uh, independent systems of cooperation. We need to create a second realm. So thanks, guys. Yeah, if there's questions, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, great question. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> yeah, actually, that's changed quite a bit. Uh, it's advanced uh, quite a bit since um, I actually put this presentation together. But I'm um, actually um, after the fest, I've got everything loaded in my car, and I'll be moving down. To, I'll, I'll be strategically relocating down to Austin, Texas, um, to move in with one of my co. So that's going to be the first step is getting uh, well, I'll have a freedom cell there, Derek. Um, you know, once I move to Austin, and uh, that'll be a really great first step towards it. Um, but in the next year, year and a half, I'm uh, going to be working towards being a van nomad, um, and I'm just going to travel around uh, all the time, and uh, you know not live on not live on much so um that's kind of the the more longer term goal but for right now i'm relocating to austin to, to be around like-minded people and uh then i'll work towards van nomadism and uh, hopefully uh you know with the lifestyle being so cheap i'd like to uh you know save up some money and then i'd like to buy a sailboat too and sail around but that's that's way far out there uh, i've never sailed a boat so that's the the long-term goal but uh yeah any other questions vanarchy, vanarchy yes vanarchy yep yep exactly anything else No? Okay. Cool. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.